Hi, I'm Alex. And I'm Eddie. Welcome to the 21st episode of Catch 52, a politics podcast brought to you by WDSR, Duquesne Student Radio. We are 30 weeks away from Inauguration Day 2021, and at long last, 21 episodes in, the episode we have been talking about doing for literally 20 episodes now, the polling episode. Uh, we've, we've been hitting at this for a, a long, long time, um, and we think... Uh, with polls starting to accelerate for the general election and all the Senate elections and everything coming up, it's about time we talk about polls, how to read them, and why they're good. There's a lot of controversy with polls going on right yeah. now because there are there you sort of like like most things uh, related to politics these days, it polarizes the country, um, and so on. On it's not exactly an even split, but you have. People who, I mean, let's face it, polls are boring unless it's your job or you just are kind of a weird person. Most people don't wake up in the morning and say, all right, let's check the new polls. Um, you really only hear about them if they're presented by or brought up by like a mainstream news network or something like that. Um, and even then, after they say the poll, they'll inevitably have anywhere from two to like 10 people on a panel debating the merits of the poll so it's impossible to actually think for yourself when you've got you know that many yeah. people trying to think for you so instead we decided to tell you where to find these polls how to read them and how to interpret them for yourself so you don't have the people on cnn or fox telling you what to think of their polls um you get a lot more information out of the objective numbers than you do out of the opinions based on those numbers yeah that's absolutely right because CNN, look, CNN is not really a, pol a political network. It's an entertainment network. Mm -hmm. It's run by the president of CNN. It was the former president of ESPN. They're not there to actually give you information. They're there to get those sweet, sweet views. And yes. honestly, you can learn so, so much from just looking at a, a well-made like a well -made set of polls that you can sort of look at side by side. Yeah. And if you're, you know, if you have a little bit of an idea of what's going on, or even if you don't, a very clear story one way or another will usually emerge for most people. So let's just talk about how we get our polls and the way that we recommend that you should yeah. do it. And at least for me, that's by looking at RCP averages. Yeah. So um, generally, polls themselves have bias, uh, not necessarily intentional bias in the way that like Fox News or CNN is biased it's biased in the statistical sense in that it is not an accurate representation of the voting whole. It is as close to an accurate representation as you can get in the sample. That's what bias means. But all of these polls have different biases based on who responds, um, the methods they use, things like that. So ideally, you don't want to just use one source or one poll, but instead you want to aggregate those polls and have a group of polls that you can average together that hopefully eliminates that bias even more. So and Real Clear why. Politics. So Real Clear Politics has an aggregation uh, site, and as does Five Thirty Eight. Five Thirty Eight scores theirs, and so like some polls are generally higher quality than um, other polls, and so they gave the the they give those polls more credence, which you know you can say is good, you can say is bad. Uh, both of us personally prefer prefer Real Clear Politics just because it's. Uh, just every single poll that's somewhat credible is averaged together. And in my opinion, generally the outliers on both sides are kind of be just outsiders. So Exactly. And yeah. it's, it's a very simple website. It's very easy to use. And that's, that's the key. It actually will bring up the battleground states right off the bat. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's, it, it's a really nice spreadsheet. So you can get the date, the sample size, the margin of error, and then obviously the results and then the spread. So it does it all yeah. for you. And of course, of course, of course, it says who conducted the poll. And yeah. that is really what you're looking for. Now, 538 is not entirely useless because, yes, they rate their polls. Um, so if you're looking at a poll and it seems really weird, so... Typically, just, economist polls are very different from other polls. Exactly. Um, they're reliable, but they typically have different averages. So in races where, you know, uh, the Democrat might be up by eight points in another poll, the economist might have them up by 12 or, or up by two. Um, and that's just because they use very different methods from other places. And, you know, so when you see that at first, it might seem like an outlier, but really it probably isn't. 
and that's that's another important thing. So you can look at who has conducted the poll on RCP, and then if you are if if it doesn't seem to match the narrative, because they'll have a dozen polls lined up, and yeah. if those polls are conducted well, they should all be pretty close to or within the margin of error of one another, yeah. uh, and that is sort of what creates that story. And if there's we'll get, an outlier, we'll get into that first, yeah. But um, if there's an outlier. That's where five thirty eight comes in. I will say yeah. though, regarding economist polls. 538 had kind of like their poll Oscars or Emmys a couple of months ago. They rated Economist and YouGov polls quite highly. So you have to take them in their own context. You can't look at an Economist YouGov poll compared to a Quinnipiac poll or compared to a NBC or Fox News poll. You have to look at it in that context. Mm -hmm. Which leads us to talking about polls and context because that's yeah. the so second most important part. The the one thing we'll all also mention before we get into this is real clear politics, great for aggregating polls. Oh yeah. <laughs> not reliable as a news source. Um, just objectively, it's it's opinion based majority wise. So yep. um, their opinions, not necessarily the best thing, but their aggregation of polls is is very, very good. So with that said, let's get into a phrase that um, Probably anyone that's been listening to politics at all in the past four years has heard, and that's the polls were wrong in 2016. The polls Um, were wrong in 2016, guys. And this, honestly, honestly, I feel like this viewpoint stems from really one thing, and it's that the Huffington Post called the election for Clinton before, the, the like the night before. It was that and the fact that New York Times at the very beginning put Clinton had a two thirds advantage of winning, same with 538. It's a you know, 538, I think, had a 75% chance of Clinton winning at the very beginning. But the important thing to remember that Nate Silver distinguished is that if there's a 25% chance of a thunderstorm and a thunderstorm happens, that is not inaccurate. Reading polls is, I mean, yeah. it's not as, it's kind of like predicting the weather a little bit. You can be like, well, obviously, you know, people's minds are made up. One thing's going to happen. It's going to be one or another. Actually, that may not be the case. There's yeah. a, there is a statistically significant percentage of the electorate that actually makes up their mind in the election booth, which mm-hmm. is crazy, but that's just the world we live in. And how can we expect polls to account for that when those people don't even know who they're going to vote for? So that's why we have the margin of error. Polling yeah. is definitely a science, and it, we can call it that for a reason, because it is, at its core, scientific. Yeah, so the margin of error, so any poll, you know, will say Biden up by five, for example, nationally. But they'll also say Biden up by five, margin of error, three and a half percent, two to three and a half percent typically. And that three and a half percent means Biden could be up by eight and a half percent, or he could be up by only, what, one and a half percent. Right. And so that margin of error is super important when looking at those 2016 polls they they show that that was not wrong. So if you look at the polls nationally going into election day, you have Clinton up three, Clinton up four, Clinton up four, Clinton up four, typically. And those margin of errors are three to two points. And guess what? Clinton won by 2.1 nationally. So, so those within, were within the margin, the margin of, of error, error. Yes. easily. Which means, um, guess what? The polls were correct. Yes. However, it is not, you can't in a single poll, poll the electoral college. They were yes. only to poll the popular vote. And yeah. Clinton won the popular vote, and so the we'll, polls are not wrong. We'll get into national polls in a second, but if you, again, just looking at 2016, in Pennsylvania, um, the most recent poll from Morning Call put Clinton at a plus four, but a 5.5% margin of error, meaning Trump winning by seven or 0.7 is within the margin of error. Exactly. And then the other poll that was released uh, just a day before the election was uh, Trafalgar, and that was Trump up Trafalgar. plus one. Trafalgar, Trafalgar, whatever. Um, Trump up plus one with a margin of error of 2.7. Again, all of the polls were within the margin of error from the month before the election leading up. All of them showed Clinton with a slight lead, but that margin of error putting Trump still in the lead. The, exactly. the best way, uh, 538 does a really good job of, of showing the margin of error on their polls. So you can see, for example, in that, you'd see that the, the main line shows Clinton up 4% but there's a big cloudy line behind it that right. shows Trump up by one or Clinton up by six. Um, 90, and that means that 95%, so of all of the probabilities, right? 95% of the probabilities occur between those two gray lines. Yeah. And if, assuming they're doing, you're using like a, a, an, a, a common method of yeah. standard deviation. So they will show two standard deviations 
math, bear with me, two standard deviations away from the average. And that yeah. is 95%, which means that 95% of the outcomes based on the data that they got occur within that range. And that range is based on the margin of error. It should be two standard deviations away. Yeah. So all that said, though, um, it is not, uh, the, the polls in 2016 were not entirely correct. Um, so Pennsylvania, they were pretty much spot on, but in Ohio and Michigan, especially, and in Wisconsin, they did not fully capture the voting base. So where the polls were wrong in 2016, where especially in Wisconsin, where they showed Clinton up plus six with a margin of error of four to five. So typically Clinton should be up by one. She ended up losing by one. Mm -hmm. Um, and the common, you know, reasoning for how that happened was Trump's, you know, quote unquote, silent majority, where he had a bunch of people that weren't listening to pollsters that weren't talking to pollsters, that pollsters weren't even contacting because they didn't think they were likely voters. That is where the polls did go wrong in 2016. But by and large, the polls were correct in almost now, every single a, state. There's the polls an entirely were correct. compelling reason, though, the explanation for why those polls were in why those polls were wrong and you yeah. you actually just said it polar pollsters try to get an accurate representation of the electorate right and that means using registries lists databases of yeah. likely voters because guess so, what half this country this country is only comprised of 50 percent likely voters so pollsters can't just call random yeah. like they can but there are not that three simple. types of political polls. There are three types of political polls. There are all adults, registered voters, and likely voters. Each one of those gets more specific and more accurate, but the problem is you discard more results as you do that, just by definition, because there are way fewer likely voters than there are adults, and there are fewer in between even. And so um, if you have an election or a particular candidate that draws out vote registered voters who are not on the likely voter rolls, Pollsters yeah. will miss those voters, and that's what happened in 2016. Yeah. The, uh, the the story of tr of Trump's forgotten man, the silent ma I don't like silent majority. That's that's majority his quote. Describe. That's that's his words. I'm, well, that's yeah. because he's trying to co op Reagan's language, and <laughs> you know I don't think he's earned that. But <sighs> it is true that Trump drew a lot of people out of the woodwork, um, and. We're not going to go into why, but that, that's just objectively. That's something that happened. There were Democrats who switched party affiliation yeah. because of it. Um, there were people who voted for the first time. There was a story that went around of like a 93-year-old woman who had never registered to vote, yeah. but registered to vote for Trump. Um, that was a thing that happened. Those voters, though, are now on the likely voter but, registry. Or at the means, very least, the registered voter. Yes. So in, in 2016, the the silent majority was not accurately counted in some states in wisconsin in michigan and somewhat in ohio those were not accurately counted but in most states even those those tr new trump republicans or new republicans for trump or any of the trump special base um those people came were not counted in 2016 but they were counted in 2018 where and they in 2020 showed, yes yeah, so they consistently showed in 2018 in 2018 Big Democratic pickups in the House. And guess what happened? Big Democratic pickups in the House. There were very few upsets in 2018. Um, I mean, even the race Alex and I will also always harp on, Paul Davis. It showed it going ways. neck and neck with Paul Davis up 1%, I believe, in the last poll going in. And Paul, with a margin of error of like three, he lost by 2%. Again, one with a margin of error of three puts that poll correct. Even though the the average result was not correct, the poll was still correct. So we've now had two elections for pollsters to two elections worth of data where this on Trump voters. on Trump voter where the silent majority has voted. And that is going to help out a lot because once you have people who have as somebody who has phone banks before uh, it's very easy for a lot of these organizations to get access to voter rolls. And it's very, very obvious to figure out who is a likely voter and who is not. If somebody's voted in every election for the last 20 years, they're a likely voter. 
if somebody had never voted and then they voted in 2016 and 2018, that is statistically significant data that points to that voter being a likely 2020 voter. And a lot of times they won't just call likely voters. They'll call all registered voters and ask them, do you, like, how enthusiastic are you to vote? Do you think you're going to vote? Yes. Like that. And that way they can literally tell if someone believes that they are a likely voter and write them down. And so likely voter counts were much more accurate in 2018. Odds are they're going to be even more accurate in 2020. If Double the not, data. Yeah, if not possibly skewed to the right because now the the um, very impassioned voter base that might be coming out that hasn't come out before are black Democratic voters supporting the Black Lives That's Matter. True. And That's true. That's true. White Republican voters who are voting for a candidate who they finally believe represents their interests. So, you know, obviously I'm not going to get over enthusiastic here and say the polls are definitely going to underrepresent, you know, the black vote or the Democratic vote, because I don't think that's the case. I trust pollsters to um, see trends come up and anticipate those in poll. Right. Um, However, there is a possibility. But yeah, let's get into specific polls now. Kind right, of. because this is this is this is where we talk about the right way to read polls, right? Yes. So we've been talking about how we can we can look at national polls and we can look at how national polls may have skewed, mm-hmm. but as we get more and more specific, as you said earlier, we get a more and more accurate picture of what's going on, and yeah. we we're not going to beat around the bush. Just by RCP, we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven states that they are saying will decide this election. Yeah. I am inclined really to – real, yeah, really, it's, it's, it's three as sort of like bellwether states. Yeah. If those three states go a particular direction, the rest will follow or yeah. – yeah, I mean, depending. Even but really two, but – This is true. Okay, so we've got seven states that will decide the election. We've got Wisconsin, Florida, hmm, Michigan, Pennsylvania, North Carolina, Arizona, Minnesota. All right? Yeah. That's a pretty fair list. So – if the election only matters in those states, national polls, yeah, don't really matter a that huge much. Deal doesn't so, matter if the population of New York has gone up substantially yeah. because Democrats are always going to win, and that's a set number of votes. Let's let's talk about national polls for a second. Uh, national polls make the headlines the most. Right, so having a poll, the the NPR post that came out what two days ago, three days ago, or like approval says, rating polls. Yeah, Biden up plus eight. In the country. So right now, according to NPR, with a three and a half percent margin of error among registered voters, Biden is up by eight percent, which is a big deal. That is national news worthy because up eight percent in a national vote margin typically means that you are going to do well across the country. Mm -hmm. But it does not necessarily mean that you are going to do well across the country because, like Alex said, all of New York could go blue or all of California could go blue. And with the electoral college system, that doesn't change anything. That's why Clinton having positive polls nationally was commonly Not. seen as the polls being wrong because people saw, oh, well, Clinton was winning nationally and she lost the election. But the first off- The consequences of yeah. the widely distributed, disseminated polls were wrongly interpreted. Yes. The- Polls that say Clinton is winning nationally does not mean Clinton is winning the election. It means Clinton is winning the most support, but that does not win an election necessarily. But 8%, that does do a lot better to win the election. But again, 8% doesn't mean you're going to win the election. Instead, what wins you the election is winning those seven states, especially winning Wisconsin, Michigan, and Pennsylvania. Correct. I, I kind of, when I looked at RCPs, like, I assumed they had it in the order of which it was, like, close, because mm-hmm. I saw Wisconsin first, but then I saw Florida. I, look, there, I will continue on this spiel. Florida's a lost cause. Florida will stay red for eternity, as far as I'm concerned. But let's, let's, let's ignore Florida for now. Uh, how do we read state-by-state polls? Let's start off with the one that matters the most, Wisconsin. Yes, Wisconsin is known as the bellwether state in this election wisconsin was the closest uh, yep. followed by pennsylvania then michigan i believe yeah um, ohio is traditionally no, sorry, sorry. Uh, i got that backwards wisconsin was the third closest behind pennsylvania and michigan meaning if wisconsin goes blue that means almost definitely michigan's going blue and pennsylvania's and Penn- going blue right. which is enough for biden to win the electoral college so but if wisconsin doesn't go blue 
that means Michigan might not and Pennsylvania might not. So it's really the bellwether state in this election. That's correct. Now, traditionally, Ohio has been the yeah. bellwether state. It was in 2012. It was in 2016. It was in 2008, um, which I feel like are the elections where it's fair to draw on. Yeah. That said, Ohio, well, Ohio didn't go super blue in 2018 because of um, some pretty extreme gerrymandering, particularly in the Columbus uh, yeah. suburbs. However, uh, o- Ohio is one of those states, Ohio is kind of like, um, I, I treat Ohio a little bit like Florida. Yeah, they're, they're the two biggest states that are trending red right now. Yes. And they will they will continue to do so. I'm At I'm not too sure view. about Florida. I think Ohio's definitely more red than Florida is personally. Um, oh, I, I definitely agree. But and I think Florida's been trending red longer, but it's been trending red slower. Ohio is trending red very fast. Mike DeWine yes. is their governor, a a very very pro life heartbeat bill type Republican. Yep. Um, whereas Florida has slightly more moderate corrupt politicians instead of. <laughs> you know, radical John Kasichs. Um, <laughs> right. Radical versions of John Kasich is, yeah. is what I mean by that. Um, but looking at state-by-state state polls, again, this is what actually will determine the election. But you have to take these polls also with, not with a grain of salt, but with, with caution. A margin of error. Because those national polls have, let's just look at these numbers, uh, 1,500, 950, 2,300, 800, 1,300 voters. So it's a lot of voters. But if you look at Wisconsin polling, you have 200, 600, 800. You're, you're polling about half as many people. And that means to an extent, those polls are not going to be as reliable. That let's, although, 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 there is a, there is kind of a fundamental fallacy when it comes to sample size and most people think that the higher your sample size the more accurate your poll and that it goes in a and that accuracy and sample size track linearly so the more that is it that is not true the relationship between accuracy and sample size is logarithmic and what that means is there's a there's a very there's exponential growth well logarithmic growth but bear with me there is a big jump in um going from zero to 30 from zero to 30 massive difference right but then the difference from 30 to um 200 or 30 to two to 200 is exponentially uh less accurate than every new person added so the difference between a 250 person Mm -hmm. sample size and an 800 person sample size it, it seems large because yeah. four times the number of respondents but actually in terms of overall accuracy it's 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 rather slim yeah and if you um the, the reason that they're not doing you know 1500 voters is because it actually starts to go down the more voters you have that represent a higher number of the population correct because then that's more people who are not being heard it's hard it's hard to explain but the more people you poll the more certain opinions get overrepresented. So that's why um, you don't have 1,500 people. I think if you poll over 30% of a population, it's considered a statistically inaccurate poll. So you want somewhere in between 30 voters and 30% of voters. Obviously, they're not going to poll 30% of voters in Wisconsin because that's huge, but you want to keep the the numbers small on your polls, under 1,000, under 1,500 um, exactly. In a in a state poll and under like ten thousand national. And there's other mathematical tools that pollsters can use as well to diminish outliers and things like that. All right. So now that we've addressed the sample <laughs> size, let's get into and on and also by the way, the sample size, how you interpret the sample size can be informed by the margin of error. Yeah. So for example, this two hundred the the uh, the second poll in the RCP, you know, ca- average for Wisconsin. Uh, average for Wisconsin does not have a margin of error. So it's by, and it's a CNBC and democratic uh, organization poll. So lower sample size, no registered margin of error. However, ironically, it actually has Biden up by his lowest amount out of all of the polls. Yeah. So again, it's, that's something to take with a grain of salt. If mm-hmm. it had Biden up by a, by a lot, 
but it actually has Biden up by the least out of any of them. So it actually does add to the narrative. That's why you have to, you're taking all these different things, putting them together and you have yeah. to say whatever that poll means for you. So for me, that poll is showing that Democrats are being awfully conservative yeah. with how they are trying to judge. And actually looking at the poll, um, it's actually a 2.7% margin of error. Okay. So that poll puts Trump almost neck and neck with Biden in Wisconsin, whereas every other single poll puts Trump up or puts Biden up like six to eight. So the, the Democrats are also being very, very careful with their polling to not have the same mistakes, especially in Wisconsin that they did last time, yep. which is why you know, New York Times and Siena have um, Biden up by 11. Fox has Biden up by nine, but NBC has Biden up by four. And that's Fox. Yeah. And Fox like, News has him up by nine. But again, let's look at those margins of error on the small side. Um, that Biden plus 11 is a 4.3% margin of error. That Biden plus nine is a 3.5% margin of error. That puts both of them around 6%. Uh, maybe Which is within the margin of error of Biden's plus eight on the Marquette poll. And, and also within the margin of error of the Biden plus four. So again, like all that margin of error averages out to about Biden plus eight, which is again, what the average number of the, of all those results is in the poll. And that's why the margin of error is important when looking at any specific poll, because it gives you a better, um, it gives you a better idea of what other polls might be showing. So we've got Wisconsin done. We've gone through how to read polls, why polls are changing, how they've changed. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about the new polls. They've been making headlines because Trump is getting absolutely bodied right now. Yeah. So again, take general election polls for what they are as meaningless. They are electorally meaningless, but they are politically significant. So if you were to put a bunch of registered voters in a room, that's that poll would be important. You yeah. could predict the likelihood of which you're going to meet uh, a Biden supporter versus a Trump supporter. And what, what these national polls do is they track, just like popularity, how well Trump is doing yeah, nationally, how, how the average voter will, will see Trump. But again, the average voter nationally does not determine an election. It's the average voter in Wisconsin that determines an election. So, you know, these national polls recently, um, again, the left-leaning polls have Biden lower. Fox News has Biden up 12 um, the Hill is Biden up four. On average, Biden's up by 9.4% nationally, which is unheard of. Um, I mean, I, I, it's not unprecedented, but usually no, this is like popular presidents running for a second term. Reagan yeah. in um, 98. Yeah. Or 88. Or eight, Reagan 84. Right, right, right. Reagan 84. Yeah. Um, so. I mean, Obama crushed Romney in 2012 and won, won by four percentage points. Yeah. So like an 8% margin of error is huge. Obama won by seven in 2008. Like we, we haven't seen 8% margin of error in a long, long, long time. That said, this time of year in 2016, Clinton was up by six points. Yeah. It was but... 1996 was the last time there was an 8% um, uh, victory. And that was Clinton winning against Bob Dole. And also because of, and also via piggybacking off of Newt Gingrich's yeah. government shutdown. But let's so, also mention that that was the last time, an, or uh, an impeached president, well, Clinton wasn't impeached then, but that was the last time um, talks of impeachment surrounded a presidential election. So, But again, we've got, the, we've got completely the opposite. But yeah. I think it's not because of people being like, oh, impeachment. I feel like that's yeah. kind of in, in the rear view mirror right now, if not yeah. out completely. People out of sight, aren't really talking about Trump's impeachment <laughs> at all. No. So let's go to the next state that RCP has uh, after Wisconsin. We've got Florida, where, um, where to, again, I don't think that this poll represents reality, but that's because of my own personal bias against Florida. They know what they did. Um, Biden is up by six, uh, 6.8 points, according to the RCP average. But let's, um, let's again, Obama won in 2008 by 2.8%. So this is on average four or almost three times as much than Obama won by four points more. All right, which we do have something that we need to talk about right away, which is a poll conducted from on May 26th by St. Pete Polls yeah. with a massive almost 4,700 person sample size mm -hmm. that says Biden's only up by one. Yeah. Let's talk about that because that is... That, see, this is what I'm saying. RCP is helpful because it can identify outliers. 
um, it is within the margin of error for Trump to actually be ahead in this poll. Yeah. So let's say Biden's up plus one, one and a half points of uh, error. Trump could be actually up in Florida by half a point, according to that poll. Yeah, I'm, I'm looking up the real clear politics to see what they um, say about that. But again, like if you look at the polls that actually have a lot of credibility to them. So Fox News is even an A minus in polling. New York yeah, Fox News is an A plus. Uh, Fox News skews slightly la- or right in their polling, but generally in their polling, they're actually pretty accurate. So um, Fox News has Biden at plus nine with a three uh, three points of error. Uh, yeah, so St. Pete Times... is at St. Pete is a C in polling. Well, there we um, go. So that's that's Do they skew which way? Uh, St. Pete is a Republican plus point four percent. Okay. So well, odds are that means they're actually. 1.5 percent biden but also keep in mind that humongous sample size starts to take away from the voters who are not being represented in that meaning this poll is probably inaccurate because there are so many people and also it's registered voters not likely voters if you look at likely voters ah. biden's up by 7 to 11 it's for, it's 4700 registered voters that's an, another important distinction and yeah. we can also toss out that poll because it could it is kind of an anathema to the rest of the narrative, which is Fox News plus nine, New York Times plus six, CNBC and the internal Democratic poll plus seven, TIPP, which I've never heard of, uh, plus 11. Yeah. And all so, those with uh, statistically significant sample sizes. And margins of errors of about three to 5%. So again, all of those put themselves in the same range Um of each other, but that St. Pete poll is kind of an outlier and is probably not as accurate as it seems to be. Um, At this point in 2016, Trump was up by a point and a half. Obama in 2012 was up by 0.9. In 2008, Obama was leading by 2.8 yeah, at so this time in Florida. It's a, it's a very, very different um, experience. Well, actually, no, at this time in Florida, it was different. At this time in Florida, in 2008, it was um, actually it was McCain plus eight or Obama plus two. So again, there they weren't really sure who to poll. The the polls really um, contradict each Completely other. Completely different world though. Polling in two thousand eight yeah. than right now. The Republican polling, Party has changed so yeah. much. Polling in twenty twelve put Clinton or in twenty sixteen. Sorry, put Clinton up about three to four points. Okay, and she ended up losing by about one point two. So again. Um, another nice thing about Real Clear Politics is they archive all of their former poll results. So when you click on a state, you can see their former results, see exactly where they were. So in Florida, we can say probably Trump's going to gain at least four points back over the coming months, especially because Trump tends to gain a lot of points in debates. Trump just happens. Typically what happens in debates is there'll be a debate. Trump goes up um, by you know two to four points and then loses about half of that support in the next month and then the next debate happens and that happens again so he like very slowly climbs back in debates just because he's an entertaining debater uh, yep. that's what we saw in the primaries that's what we saw in the general that mm-hmm. even though clinton had you know a better debate performance in terms of actually debating trump did better in polling so people said clinton did better but people supported trump more afterwards it's a it's a really weird paradigm there but that's that's all right that's let's, Trump. let's let's get a few more of these battleground states in here because yeah. it's worth talking all of these polls are super important let's yeah. hit michigan next and again um, we continue with the story what's up it's just uh, you you see a big difference in these polls so again cnbc oh, and yeah, trafalgar wow. cnbc and trafalgar i think trafalgar is left-leaning um biden plus two biden plus one trafalgar is actually a republican i believe Okay, but um, New York Times, TIPP, and MRA, EP, Epic, I don't, Epic Times maybe? I don't know. Um, plus 11, sure. plus 13, plus 16. Um, which... The Detroit Free Press. Okay, so like that's, that's a lot. Biden up by 11. Uh, that's, that's, again, bigger than Obama had in 2012. Um, like, that, that's a pretty significant margin to be winning by in 2016 trump was up in michigan um or let's let's look 2016 well at this uh, time clinton was up clinton was up by three in michigan so let's say trump gains three percentage points great on this average biden's still up by five points 
five points even with a margin of error of four points that yeah. puts him up by one that means if the elect again things can change so polls you have to remember do not stay consistent at all because people do not stay consistent at all especially with trump people go back and forth a lot especially in battleground states like Wisconsin, oh, yeah. michigan and pennsylvania um, Trump's approval has not been as high as it was since he got elected in any of those states. It, he was elected about a month later, dropped by like 10 points and hasn't really recovered since then is going down now, as we can see. 37% right now, I believe. Yes, but still Trump is an enigma and you cannot say conclusively that Biden being up by 16 is, <laughs> is a victory. Exactly. Even So these polls, are probably accurate for right now, but there's a long time to go. But again, big news. Um, moving on to Pennsylvania, the three most recent polls, um, two of which are from likely voters, not even registered voters, Biden plus again, six, Biden plus three, again. Biden plus 10, um, from Harper, New York Times, and CNBC. Again, Biden winning above the margin of error. Uh, Another thing, let's, let's, let's talk about this real quick, because we've been talking about narratives that that appear in polling across different states with the same organization. So the CNBC and change research poll is consistently having Biden as it's consistently having a sample size of about 500 people Mm -hmm. and consistently showing Biden still leading, but lower than other polls. Yeah. So we can look at that and say that they're definitely offsetting at a higher rate than other polls are. They're trying to reach more of the possible silent majority. Yes. Uh, to try and not overcount or for Democratic turnout. Whereas New York Times, which is one of the best polling agencies in the country, is Got it. among Stay. registered voters at 10%. But again, among likely voters, Biden's a little less. But again, there's, there's a the lot same there. thing happening. And in 2016, at this time, tr- uh, Clinton was up by three. So was we can expect... Three. Trump, again, we can expect Trump between, again, if the polls hold true, which there's an argument to be had that the polls back then were not as accurate as the ones that we have now, but let's, mm-hmm. let's give it the benefit of the doubt and say that there's more of a silent 3%. majority. Let's say Trump gains three points, Biden's still up by three, but it's within the margin of error. Yeah. But that's why people are really freaking out about these polls, especially in the mainstream media. It's because this is the first time when we've had this consistent of a set of polls that show Biden with a definitive lead in spite of yeah. Trump gaining three points, in spite of the margin of error. And also another really important thing to look at here is not only how much Biden is up by, but how much support Biden has. 49%, 50%, and 49%. Clinton, nationally, never polled 50%. Yep. Clinton and in that's... Pennsylvania, Wisconsin, and Michigan never polled 50%. Biden is polling 50% nationally and in all of those. And it's showing that Biden is doing better among independents, which is a group that Trump overwhelmingly won by, I believe, about six points in 2012. Mm -hmm. Biden is now winning independents by about that much. Yeah. Um, And so moving on to North Carolina, we're seeing a very, very close race within the margin of error. Uh, Biden 2, Biden 2, Trump 3, Biden 2, and Biden 9. But that was about a week ago. So the most optimistic of Clinton pollsters said that Clinton might be able to t- take North Carolina in 2016. Obviously, that did not happen. No. Um, and the ev- and uh, the proof is in the pudding. The rest of the battleground states where Biden is up by sort of historic numbers, we've only got Biden up by the largest. Uh, this New York Times poll, I think we can throw out having Biden up by plus nine um, yeah. because the rest of them show Biden plus in a three, very close plus race. Three. Plus um, two and a half, plus two. Trump up by three in one by uh, Grave, Gravis. So I don't know who that is. This is a very similar um, spread to 2016 where uh, yes. it was Trump plus two, Clinton plus two in the two polls around this time. But Clinton support was 44 and 40 then. Biden's support now is 48 and 47 and 43. So it's... It's, again, about four points higher, but there are just also more committed Trump voters. It's um, true. And fewer undecided. A narrative consistently emerges. Biden seems to have anywhere between two to six points worth of support that Clinton was not able yeah. to have. And two to six points, if that support stays. 
wins Michigan, wins Wisconsin, wins Pennsylvania, wins Minnesota, wins right. Florida, wins North Carolina, wins Maine, wins New Hampshire, wins Arizona, wins New Mexico. So the reason the pollsters are freaking out right now is because if the election was held today, Biden would win in a landslide victory. You know, an actual brag-worthy historic landslide. Yes, um, but that is not necessarily what we're looking at now. No. So let's move to Arizona. Yeah. Arizona is a super interesting state because you want to talk about demographics. This is a, Arizona is a prime example of a state that Democrats can pick up in the long term. Mm -hmm. Demographics are moving, are shifting into their favor. Romney won Arizona for context. Yeah. By nine points in 2012. That's not even a swing state. That's solid red. Yes. Now, well, what do we have? Biden up on the RCP average by plus four. And let's let's also mention that Trump lost five points, five and a half points to Romney. And Trump only won by 3.5, which means Arizona, in a high Republican turnout election, still moved six points towards, towards Democrats. They now have a Democratic uh, governor and a Democratic senator, two Demo no, one Democratic senator, and a About to be very two. close race, a very, very close race, which will get to probably in a later episode yeah um but again fox arizona news, fox news has biden up by four mm -hmm. new york times has biden up by seven and again the conservative cnbc poll has estimate. biden up by one yeah. but again that that conservative estimate is the only likely voter poll um all the other ones are registered voters so there's something to be said about maybe arizona is not as close as or not as definite of a poll as new york times or fox news is saying but it's it's a close race leaning blue which yep. is surprising considering just eight years ago it was almost 10 percent more red um and lastly minnesota i think especially considering um the fact that george floyd and the entire black lives matter new wave has started from minnesota that democrats shouldn't have really an issue um gravis I mean, released the poll uh, Biden up 16 in Minnesota. And not like, oh, it's just Biden up by 16. It's Biden w with 58%. Yeah. So Minnesota was considered a possibly red moving state about as slow as Florida has been moving. So it's still like I don't probably think we're democratic in that direction anymore. But I think now um, Minnesota is abolishing their, or uh, Minneapolis is abolishing their police force. I don't think that that's going to counteract very much unless something really goes wrong in minnesota i think it's probably no longer a swing state um but again what we saw was in 2008 obama won by 10 percent in 2016 clinton won by a one and a half percent so it's moved almost as much as arizona has probably just about as much as arizona has but it's snapped all the way back now let's be real there's there's not really enough rcp data no to have a clear-cut picture because they're only showing three polls they're, one of yeah. them is one from uh one taken on juneteenth which is kind of odd yeah. um and then one taken in the end of may and then the next poll after that is taken in october um i yeah. don't understand how they did that but. looking at yeah so looking at real clear politics that's just because people haven't been polling in Minnesota as much. Um, they have Gravis, they have the um, poll from May, and then they have the polls from October. It's just people haven't been polling there. Nope. So, excuse me. So, and again, another nice thing about RCP is that they're not, they don't have enough data to offer a polling average, so they're just not offering one. They're not like yeah. trying to they're not stitch going to it together. But again, this is what's important about polling. Look at the margin of error, Look at the polls in context of not only that one polling organization's past polls, but also their current polls and also all of the other polls aggregated together. That is how you accurately view polls. Those polls, the aggregated polls, told the truth in 2016. They told the truth in 2018, and they probably will be telling the tr truth in 2020. Probably. Probably. I mean, hey, 95% chance that they'll be telling the truth, and we will be... In the lead up to this election, we will be looking at those polls every week when yeah. they come out. The, they tell a story. The the most statistically correct way you could say what happened in the 2016 election was that there was a 95% chance that there was a 75% chance that Hillary Clinton would win. 
that is that is actually what the polls predicted and the polls predicted that correctly because there that means there is a you know 30ish percent chance that Donald Trump wins a one in three chance and that's what happens because just because something's above 50 percent does not mean that it's going to happen mm-hmm. and yeah there's nothing really else more to say on it we have yeah. many many months in between now and the election mm-hmm. who knows what's going to happen the way this year has gone yeah. um before we close though it's definitely worth taking into account what how non-talking heads are reacting to this because usually whenever a poll comes out um cnn will have somebody on to say how great this is for trump and how great this or how great this is for biden Mm -hmm. um let's step away from the media cycle here because republicans are starting to speak out about this which means they are starting they are taking it seriously we all know that the democrats and republicans have their own internal polling and Mm -hmm. republican senators congressmen congress people um they tend to listen to their internal polling um in a primarily after sort of mainstream media polling and there was a there was a super super notable interview that i want to talk about because and i can't believe i'm saying this it happened on fox business with Stuart varney the guy who complained about 99 percent of poor people having a refrigerator um he was on talking to uh what was her name? Ronna McDaniel, who's actually the chairwoman of the RNC. He was pressing her quite hard because Bank of America had released a statement saying that Biden winning would be bad for stocks. Um, Surprisingly, regulating banks is bad for banks. Darn. (laughs) So naturally, Bank of America's representatives on television went to talk to Bank of America's representatives at the Hill about what's going on uh the parent company <laughs> is is saying that this is bad so we have to fix it and she gave an unusually candid uh response to varney's questioning i'm talking about internal polls he goes why won't you release the internal polls <laughs> she goes well we have him we have him uh we have him keeping pace and keeping even in all the swing states <laughs> and he's ahead in ohio according to that interview ahead in ohio ahead in north carolina which again is the republicans even admitting that trump is is losing ground um even in the republicans best estimates trump's duking it out in wisconsin michigan and pennsylvania again um and maybe winning in north carolina but it's it's not the best odds looking at the polls for trump right now again plenty can change but this episode should hopefully let you know when you see that poll uh, don't listen to CNN. Don't listen to Fox. Look it up. Read it yourself. There's yeah. and look to the reactions of the people who will be affected by the polls. Senate Majority Whip, Republican Majority Whip John Thune gave a kind of concerned, a cautionary speech this week, saying that Republicans need to reconsider their election strategy for the first time in, I think, since. Uh, did Trump endorse Roy Moore in the primary in Alabama? I believe so, yeah. Okay. So I think this might have been the first time that this has ever happened in the Trump era, but a Trump-endorsed Republican lost their primary. So uh, Yeah. In and now, um, North Carolina, I believe, actually. In North Carolina. Now, that was a case of a very, very attractive candidate for that district defeating a candidate who is pretty much only pro Trump and nothing else about them. Well, it was Trump's chief of staff's wife's friend. Yeah. So Mark Meadows, who's currently the chief of staff, uh, his wife's friend ran in this district, which is an incredibly safe district for Republicans. So don't worry, don't worry about anything <laughs> happening, but she got the endorsement and everybody was kind of just standing there like, hang yeah. on a second. And then this, and then this other person ran um a disabled veteran younger than aoc uh he's tw- like 25 he's, yeah, well, he's 24 he will, be 25. he will be 25 so he will be just i think like three months under or over the deadline to be in congress so like very young new republican type candidate um 
and he ended up winning. But yep. the the big thing is that the Republicans have completely abandoned their strategy from 2012. After Romney lost, the the RNC put together a brand new strategy of how we are going to appeal get to votes moving forward, and that's appealing to women and appealing to people of color. This was called and the then, Growth and Opportunity Project. And then they elected Trump. Um, and now their strategy is to invigorate Trump voters. And that's, which, that's not just the Republican Party strategy. You know it's the strategy because that's what Trump and Trump's people have said. That's what Kelly Gunn yeah. Conway has gone on the news and said. She said, we don't need any more new voters. We are just going to energize our base. Yeah. But guess what? Trump won because of independence. Whoever wins, yeah. wins because of independence. Trump's base, has slowly back off. Trump's base has been weaning off very, very slowly. As he says, maybe we should slow down testing so it doesn't look as bad as he's putting openly neo-Nazi symbols on his Facebook ads, as he's saying that the money from the Saudis matter more f- than the children dying in Yemen, pretty much explicitly saying that. like it's He's been losing support among a lot of the people that want him that election. So invigorating his base, uh, as, June, as John Thune says, is not necessarily the best strategy to winning. Just... Just like the Confederacy, it's a four-year fling the South is starting to <laughs> step away from. <laughs> um, and it's, it, I mean, it's not just the South, though, because like Trump won because of the Midwest. Yeah. I'm living, I'm sitting here in suburban Pittsburgh. People are, people here are changing. And it's difficult to tell because all of your, all the people who I know that are like hard Trump supporters, they're not changing, but it's not about those people. It's about the people on the margins. And I can the, think the of a, slightly liberal, slightly conservative, you know, the, the libertarian, fiscally conservative, socially liberal people are starting to turn away from Trump. And it's just enough people. So even if you, you can just conduct, you can just conduct your own poll, like in your head, like, okay, I have, you know, 20 friends who I know who voted. Um, like, I, most of my friends are liberal, so it's like okay, uh, so take, like sixteen you, of them voted for Clinton, ten of or four of them voted for Trump. If that's the metric, I can think of two of those friends who are now voting for Biden. Yeah, the the easiest, simplest breakdown you can do is one third solid Democrat, one third solid Republican, one third independent. That is typically the breakdown. It's actually like twenty five Republican, twenty five Democrat, fifty independent. But you know, just among your friends, say, you know take three Democratic friends, three Republican friends, and three independent friends. See how many of those Republican friends might not even vote for Trump. See how many of those independent friends are not voting for Trump. And that's where you're going to see the difference. Mm-hmm. And there's, there's so many more ways to split this. I'm yeah. going to just say, I'm going to say one last one because I think it's the most important that we haven't brought up yet. And it's by age. Yes. And there is, I think, a bit of a myth right now, or there was a bit of a myth that Trump won because of the baby boomers and um, whoever the generation was before the silent generation. I don't know. Yeah. So, um, yeah. Cause it was greatest silent boomers. So let's, let's, let's get rid of the silent generation for a moment because they're the youngest person who's a member of the silent generation is in their mid eighties. Yeah. Um, the oldest boomers are mid are to late 70s. Biden and Trump. <laughs> Yikes. Um, and the youngest boomers are just now turning 60. I believe so. So here's an here's an odd thing. Biden's winning old people. Biden is winning among voters age 65 and up. So this idea of so either uh, something something happened. Either a lot of Trump voters who voted and were members of the silent generation either flipped, passed away or are just saying they're not voting. Um or a lot more boomers are voting for Biden and have yeah. joined that age bracket. And that's sort of what I think is going on. So this idea that uh, Trump is winning old people, old people support the Republican Party may not necessarily be true anymore. I think the Republican Party now, and we can, and this is shown in more, more recent polls, the best poll for this, economist YouGov, um, is Gen X. It's... Yeah from it's from like 65 to 40 yeah like mid 40s that's trump's base right now and the um 
surprising thing about all of that is that that older generation is turning liberal again after being such a bastion of conservative support for McCain, for Romney, that that Joe Biden, good old Joe, is is kind of coming back. And that's that's where Biden's strength but has we, we shown forget. to be so far. We forget these are all these are also the people who were Vietnam protesters. They yeah. have a liberal streak. Yeah. It's, and I think I've, a mix. I've, 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 I've had a lot of thoughts about this recently. It's almost as if the Gen Xers are kind of a reaction to that. And we're seeing that hold true in the polls, that there's kind of a reaction yeah. against activism. And so you have a generation that watched or that read about the activism of their parents and is now watching the activism of their children, Gen Zs and young millennials. And there's a really weird dynamic there. The, the way to best characterize those, um, those age groups are the boomers are a very, not revolutionary, but activist generation. Gen Z is very status quo in their beliefs. Gen, not, oh, sorry, not Gen Z, Gen X, Gen X, sorry. There we go. Is very status quo in their beliefs. <laughs> yes, millennials, that's very true. Millennials are reformist, and then Gen Z is activist again. There we go, yeah. Um, so, you know, Gen X, you're seeing a lot of that pushback because they are by and large, a pro-status quo organization, which is why they support Biden so much, because Biden represents a return to status quo. Um, (laughs) It is now uh, 3.55, so our time is just about up for this evening. It's been a bit of a long, uh, this afternoon, it's been a bit of a longer episode (laughs) than we planned, but that's fine. (laughs) Our intro and outro music is by Paul Abrams and Rock Solid Panda, and it's been produced by Elise Duda. You can find a recording of this podcast on our YouTube channel, on our Spotify, SoundCloud, or anywhere else you listen to all of the podcasts you love. Also, make sure to follow us on Facebook and Instagram at Catch52 and at Twitter at 52Catch to stay updated on any airtimes, clips, episode topics, and any upcoming guests we might want to alert you about. And if you're subscribed to us or you're following us on just one platform, guess what? It's time to double up because in the next week, we're going to be releasing platform exclusive episodes we're going to have a youtube exclusive episode which we're going to be going into a little bit more and we're going to have a audio only exclusive episode for our soundcloud spotify and podcast listeners so guess what you can follow us on your favorite podcast platform you can follow us on youtube for the video and you can follow us on facebook and instagram for the updates now you got to follow us on all of them if you want to make sure (laughs) that you know exactly what's going on (laughs) because trust me these are two episodes that you're not going to want to miss these are these are episodes we've been very excited to make this whole time but (laughs) one of them just wouldn't work over audio so we decided that instead of just ignoring audio for one week we do one exclusive each Mm -hmm. and as always we welcome your comments your feedback and your suggestions have a good friday and a great weekend